Income tax 2023-2024. Dividend income. Get ready and some coffee because contrary to popular belief, you need a strong imagination to do income tax preparation 2022-2023. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information comes from the Lion Instructions section of the Form 1040 Instructions Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're on line one income. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is kind of a funny income income statement an income statement typically having income minus expenses resulting in net income the tax income statement having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income we want taxable income as low as possible typically because that will usually result in less tax therefore when looking at line one income we would like to have that basically as low as possible having as much income exempt or not required legally to include in taxes as possible. That's the general idea. Now also note that some sources of income might be taxed at different rates, oftentimes lower rates possibly than ordinary income. Ordinary income therefore is the default progressive tax rates that we've talked about in the past. And some things might be taxed at some lesser like progressive tax rate, for example, qualified dividends. So that means that we are having an impact on the income statement of the tax return because income might be impacted to get to taxable income, but we also have an added complication with the calculation of the tax because we're not just going to apply the progressive tax rates. We have to break out the sources of income that are subject to some other tax system. So we want to keep that in mind. That's important with regards to dividends because qualified dividends might have different tax rates. Now, dividends are usually fairly straightforward with the reporting. You're usually going to get a 1099 dividend and you can see exactly where to put them. There's going to be a line for qualified dividends versus non-qualified dividends. But oftentimes we have questions about what dividends are so we can have some assurance about our tax input and so that possibly when we get to more advanced situations, we can give advice about dividends and whatnot. And there's some overlap with regards to taxation of dividends and investment strategies. So just note that most normal investors are going to be investing in stocks and bonds and, and they might be investing mainly in mutual funds. When we think of mutual funds or ETFs, we also have many people that are going to have the substantial portion of their investments under the umbrella of an IRA, a 401k, some kind of retirement plan. Note that if it's under an IRA 401k or retirement plan, the interest and dividends from those investments not may not be reported on a form uh, 1099 dividend because it may not be taxable in the current year. That's the purpose of putting them under the umbrella of a retirement plan. You might get a deferral of the taxation. And then when you take the money out, you might be subject to tax at the point in time that you take the money out. So that's the first thing to kind of uh, wrap our minds around. Uh, also, we're investing usually in mutual funds, which means that we might not be investing in individual stocks, but rather kind of pooling the money together in a mutual fund uh, type of uh, investment. And because we have a financial institution and are usually investing in publicly traded stocks, the government is usually requiring the, the brokerage firms, the financial institutions to provide us with those 1099 forms. Now, what are dividends then? We can kind of compare dividends to what you would have for a sole proprietorship. So let's say you owned your own business, you have a sole proprietorship and you have just a Schedule C business. Well, the business earns money and you would have to pay taxes on that money instead of filing a separate return. 
you would be filing a Schedule C resulting in an income statement, income minus expenses, net income, in essence, in essence, subject to the tax. And then if you pulled money out of the business, because we would still be doing bookkeeping, keeping the business checking account, for example, separate from the personal, when you pull money out of the business, we don't call that an expense, we call that a draw. So the business owns money or makes money, you pay taxes on it as it makes money. When you pull money out of the business to spend it on personal stuff, we call that a draw. You don't pay taxes on a draw typically because you already paid taxes when the business earned revenue, which you reported on the Schedule C. The draw is just the transfer from the business to you. With a, with a corporation, we have a similar situation except for the corporate entity is taxed in and of itself. So the corporate entity is now subject to tax in a similar fashion as an individual uh, is going to be subject to tax. Instead of having one owner, we have a bunch of owners that are now have a percentage of the corporation that is determined by equal shares that are going to be given out. So that's what the shares are basically doing. Why would we invest in a corporation? We want the earnings from dividends to be distributed, number one or we want the stock value to go up in value so that when we sell the stock, we'll have basically a gain, a capital gain at the point of sale. Now, as the company earns uh, uh, money, then then what, what's gonna happen is the company is gonna be paying taxes basically as they earn money. As we, the owner, want the money from the business, we can't just as an individual stockholder say, hey, give me some draws out of that business. I want some money because in order to keep all the stocks the same, they have to give dividends of equal amounts to everyone. That's one of the pros and cons of, of making everything uniform the same. So that means that everyone that has a stock has to have the same amount of dividends and it becomes an administrative kind of thing that they have to do, meaning they have to determine how much dividends they're gonna be giving and then distribute them evenly over uh, the shares of uh, stock. So now when you get the dividend, the thing is that you're going to be counting it as income. And that kind of results in a double taxation situation, which is one of the rationales for basically having possibly lower tax rate on the corporate dividends. So let me show you. So if we have a corporation, they earn money. What happens? The tax man, the tax collector, the government is going to make the corporation file as a separate entity and pay income taxes uh, as they earn the money in a similar way as if we scheduled a Schedule C, we would have to report it on the on, on our 1040, have a Schedule C and report the earnings. And then uh, then we're going to have the the corporation pay us in terms of dividends. So now the corporation earned money. They already got hit with the taxes as they earned it, as we would if we earned money on our sole proprietor. And then they're going to give the money to us in something similar to a draw, kind of like us drawing money out of a sole proprietor, but now it's called a dividend. And then again, we get hit with a tax when we pull the money out or when we get the money in the form of a dividend. That's why you have this kind of double taxation situation, which because it gets taxed at the corporate level when they earn it and taxed at the distribution level when it gets distributed in the form of a dividend. So one of that's one of the justifications to have like a a uh, different tax rate. All right. So types of dividends. Generally, you have ordinary dividends and you've got the qualified dividends. These will usually be fairly well clearly defined on the form uh, 1099 div. So the data input is pretty easy to do. It's usually just the explanation why they have it there, right? So the government is going to have incentives to want to to want people to invest in local in in u.s businesses right so that's typically the idea for the advanced status of qualified dividends to try to get people to want to invest more in uh united states uh companies right so then so they get a better tax uh rate than the ordinary dividends we'll talk about the tax rates later but that's the general idea so if you have dividends that are subject to qualified dividends then they're still going to be included in income, still subject to tax, but possibly subject to a lesser, a more favorable rate, tax rate than the ordinary dividends. In order to see that dis 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 distinction, you'll have to actually look at the calculation of the tax 
uh, on the tax return, which is usually something we let the software calculate. So that's something that you're going to have to drill down on when you when you kind of uh, look at uh, the, this component for the dividends. So here's a 1099 div. You might get a 1099 div from a financial institution, of course, and therefore it might look a little bit different, but the boxes will be labeled the same. So if you have any questions about the boxes, you can go to the 1099 div on the IRS website, look at the instructions and get further information. So you've got the total ordinary dividends and then the qualified dividends. These are the most common two boxes. And uh, notice if you have total ordinary dividends the qu and qualified dividends, the qualified dividends are not doubling. In other words, if you had 2000 up top and then down below you had uh, another 2000, that would mean that all 2000 of the dividends were qualified dividends. It would not mean that you had 4000 dividends, meaning 2000 ordinary and, and another 2000 that were qualified. So the qualified dividends are telling you how much of the of the box one are subject to the the uh, qualified portion. All right. So total capital gain distributions. So notice if a company gives out uh, money to its shareholders, if it's part of earnings, then it's going to be dividends because it came out of revenue. But if it dips into like the capital investment, like when people purchase the stock from the company, then they might have a capital gain distribution. Now, this looks complicated, but usually with your data input forms, it'll be easy to do the data input because the software will help you. But you'll have to determine where it will show up on the tax return, which will typically be on the Schedule D, possibly, as a capital gain rather than dividends. So unrecapped section uh, 1250, again, looks somewhat complicated, but it's usually fairly easy. I won't get into detail on all of these, but to input these in the tax return, and then you can research these line items if you have further questions about some of these more abstract items or unusual items. So section 1202 gain, collections 28% gain, section 897 gain, and so on, non-dividend distribution, federal income taxes. It's possible to have federal income taxes on the dividends, similar to like a W-2, but not common because most people in retirement will have their withholdings on the 1099Rs, the money that's coming out of their uh, retirement accounts, like like uh, 401k plans and IRAs and whatnot. Section 199A, investment expenses, foreign tax paid. This one could come up from time to time if there were if you had investments in other countries and they had to pay foreign taxes. Foreign country or U.S. possession, cash uh, liquidation, non-cash liquidation, exempt interest dividends, specified private activity, bond interest dividends, and then you've got the state information down below because you could possibly have withholdings from the state if the state has income taxes. Now, again, any of these boxes that are more unusual and, you're, and you have questions about, you can look at the instructions which are on the back of the form or attached to the form, or you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the tax return, we can see in page one in the income area, we've got the qualified dividends, 3A, ordinary dividends on uh, 3B. And then you might have to file a Schedule B if your dividend income is over a certain threshold, such as 1,500, in which case you would just list out the who you got the dividends from in a similar fashion as we saw with the interest. Okay, so line 3A, qualified dividends. Enter your total qualified dividends on line 3A. Qualified dividends are also included in the ordinary dividend total required to be shown on line 3B. So again, the idea would be the, the, you've got the total dividends and then you've got the qualified dividends that would be part of the total dividends, right? They're not on top of the total. So once again, enter your total qualified dividends on line 3A. Qualified dividends are also included in ordinary dividends uh, total required to be shown on line 3B. So qualified dividends are eligible for a lower tax rate than other ordinary income. So that becomes complicated. Why? Because different people have different tax rates. If you have more income, your highest tax rate is going to be higher because we have a progressive tax system. So if you want to give a favorable tax treatment to something like qualified dividends to try to incentivize people to invest in certain stocks, then 
you're going to have to uh, make it so you have a progressive tax system, which always, which has always been official, no matter what tax bracket you're in, right? Okay, so generally these dividends are shown in box uh, 1B of form 1099 div. See publication 550 for the definition of qualified dividends if you receive dividends not reported on form 1099 div. So exception, some dividends may be reported as qualified dividends in box 1B of form 1099 div, but aren't qualified dividends. Now again, this is somewhat of an unusual situation. So, so, but we have these include dividends you received as a nominee. So we talked a little bit about that whole nominee kind of system in, uh, in when we talked about the interest. So you can see the Schedule B instructions for more information on that. And this is a similar situation, noting that the 1099 dividend is going to you and it's also going to the IRS. So if we're saying, hey, some of that dividend income shouldn't be applicable to me, even though I got the 1099, I have to report it in some way on my tax return. Otherwise, the IRS will have a different number than I have and the machine, they won't even have to really audit me, right? They, because they already have the information. The computer will match up the two numbers and most likely I'm, I'm gonna have a problem. Therefore, we're gonna have to report it on the Schedule B and then show the subtraction of it for any for whatever reason came up that it should be on someone else's tax return or someone else should be responsible for paying taxes on it. Dividends you received as any share of stock that you held for less than 61 days during the 121 day period that began 60 days before the ex dividend date. So there's certain requirements in terms of how long you have to hold the stock uh, in order to get the favorable uh, treatment, which may not may fall un under the radar in that the reporters of the 1099 div don't handle that component because usually the financial institution would have to kind of figure that stuff out but possibly that's not something that they are at this point required to do right they're just required to say well it's a qualified company and therefore we're going to say it's a qualified dividend all right so the ex dividend date is the first date following the declaration of a dividend on which the purchaser of the stock isn't entitled to receive the next dividend payment when counting the number of days you held the stock include the day you disposed of the stock but not the day you acquired it see the examples that follow also when counting the number of days you held the stock you can't count certain days during which your risk of loss was diminished you can see publication 550 for more details on that dividends attributable to periods totaling more than 366 days that you received on any share of preferred stock held for less than 91 days during the 181 day period that began 90 days before the ex dividend date again this is usually not applicable or to most investors because a lot of times they're investing say again in mutual funds which are kind of pooling money together for, to make the purchases of the individual stocks and bonds. Uh, when counting the number of days you held the stock, you, you can't count certain days during which your risk of loss was diminished. Again, you can see publication 550. Dividends on any share of stock to the extent that you are under an obligation, including a short sale to make uh, related payments with respect to positions is substantially similar or related property. So payments, so again, that would be something that typically would happen on more kind of day traders, people that are trading all the time with individual stocks generally and not normal investors that are investing most likely in like mutual funds. Payments in lieu of dividends, but only if you know or have reason to know that the payments uh, aren't qualified dividends. Dividends from a corporation that first became a surrogate foreign corporation after December 22nd, 2017, other than a foreign corporation that is treated as a domestic corporation under Section 7874B. So in other words, if they're a foreign corporation, then you would think they might not qualify for the favorable dividend treatment. And then there's a question of when possibly that <laughs> took place. All right, example one, you bought 5,000 shares of XYZ Corp common stock on July 8th. So now you're the shareholder, you bought the, the stock. XYZ Corp paid a cash dividend of 10 cents per share. The X dividend date was July 16th. Uh, your form 1099 div from XYZ Corp. 
shows 500 in box 1A, ordinary dividends, and in box 1B, qualified dividends. However, you sold the 5,000 shares on August 11th. You held your shares of XYZ Corp for only 34 days of the 121 day period from July 9th through August 11th. The 121 day period began on May 17th, 60 days before the ex dividend date and the end on September 14th. You have no qualified dividends. We have revoked your qualified dividend status in that case. Okay, example two. So the facts are the same as in example one, except that you bought the stock on July 15th, the day before the ex-dividend date, and you sold the stock on September 16th. You held the stock for 63 days from July 16th to September 16th. The $500 of qualified dividends shown in box 1B of form 1099 div are all qualified dividends whew, because you held the stock for 61 days of the 121 day period. Okay, example three, you bought 10,000 shares of ABC mutual fund. So now we have a mutual fund, which is possibly more common again for smaller investors. I'll stop saying again. I got a tick of saying again all the time. Anyway, you bought 10,000 shares of ABC mutual fund common stock on July 8th. ABC mutual fund paid a cash dividend of 10 cents a share. The ex dividend date was July 16th. The ABC mutual fund advises you that the part of the dividend eligible to be treated as qualified dividend equals two cents a share. Your form 1099 div from ABC mutual fund shows total ordinary dividends of 1000 and qualified dividends of 200. However, you sold the 10,000 shares on August 11th. You have no qualified dividends from ABC mutual fund because you held the ABC mutual fund stock less than 61 days. Not typically something that most people do. Uh, so in any case, line 3B, ordinary dividends. Each payer uh, should send you a form 1099 div. Enter your total ordinary div dividends on line 3B. So we have our qualified dividends and then the ordinary dividends. So this amount should be shown on box 1A forms uh, 1099 div. You must fill in and attach schedule B. So that's going to be the same schedule as we saw with the interest. Uh, if the total is over 1,500 or you received as a nominee ordinary dividends that actually belong to someone else, because if they belong to someone else, then you would have to report them and then show that negative amount coming going in and out, which is done on uh, the Schedule B. So you would need it in that case, even if under the threshold. Non-dividend distributions. Some distributions are a return of your cost, other basis. So in other words, remember what the dividends are, are basically the what we're imagining is we own the corporation, even though we're just a little shareholder and we possibly have our money in a mutual fund, <laughs> right? We own the corporation, and the corporation generates revenue, which they call retained earnings, and then they distribute those earnings to the owner of the corporation as opposed to reinvesting back in the company so that they, so that the trade-off would be you reinvest in the company, grow the value of the stock so I can sell it at a capital gain, or you distribute the money in the form of a dividend. So they give us the money in the form of a dividend. That's when it's typically taxed. But... You can imagine that they give you the money, uh, but it's actually not money that has been earned. They tapped into the, to the, to the investments. Now, what are investments in a corporation? Well, that means when the corporation originally issued their stock and people bought them from the corporation rather than the secondary market, that's like the investment into the company. So if they're giving you money that's, that's not coming from retained earnings, but it's coming in essence from the the investment uh then then it shouldn't be classified as dividends and, and they're going to classify it possibly as as uh as something other than dividends possibly something subject to capital gains for example so you must reduce your cost or other basis by these distributions so after you get back on all of the other cost other basis you must report these distributions as capital gains on form 8949 for details you can see publication 550 so dividend tax rate 2023 so these are the rates that apply to qualified dividends based on taxable income for 2023 tax year so the general idea would be 
look, if these are qualified dividends, you're going to typically have a more favorable tax rate uh, than your ordinary income tax rate. The ordinary income is taxed at a progressive tax rate. So therefore, we have to have a whole nother progressive set of tables to tax at favorable rates. So if you're here's the filing statuses. If you're single and uh, and a zero tax rate, uh, there's a zero tax rate if your income is from zero to forty four six twenty five. This is taxable income. So zero to forty four six twenty five. Then qualified dividends. We have the zero 15 percent tax rate from forty four six twenty six to uh, four ninety two three hundred, and then twenty percent if you go up above that four uh, ninety two. So the general idea when you're talking to people would be, well, you have favorable tax rates for qualified dividends. What are the actual tax rates? Well, we have it maxed out at twenty percent, and then it could go down to fifteen based on your tax bracket and down to zero based on uh, your tax bracket, right? So zero, 15, and 20 are the rates, and it should work out that it's gonna be a better rate than your marginal or highest tax rate for ordinary income. So here's the married filing joint, zero from zero to 49 to 50, 15 from uh, 89 to 51 to 553, and then married filing separately matches the single head of household, typically like we would expect in the middle uh, of the two. So, so this is the dividend tax rate for 2024. This, so you can see uh, these two adjusted typically for uh, inflation.